thing is quality matters. So more data isn't necessarily better data. Better data is better data. Uh, so keeping a close eye on, on your quality is going to be important. Um, and and not, we're not just capturing data to capture data. There needs to be, like Colin said, there needs to be a strategy behind the data that we're capturing. Uh, because we can have massive amounts of data, but we still are going to have to analyze all that data. And so if we really want to get to the value, we need to have a strategy that's going to derive the value out of that data. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So, what we've learned, obviously, there's there's a lot of hype in big data, and if you read if you read through some of the articles, there's a lot of a lot of interesting strategies that are being used, uh, but most of it is really just hype. It, it's not a silver bullet. Um, it's not magically going to solve all of your problems. Um, it's it, a one size fits all approach doesn't work, but it is still very much in its infancy. And as the technology progresses and gets better, it's going to be it's going to be cheaper and easier to implement. And it, it might get to a point where it might be a one size fits all strategy for a particular industry. Uh, yeah. The other the other thing is we've sort of reiterated it in in the earlier slides is. Um, the, the most important thing that we found in our sort of efforts around this and in research as well is that if, if you just go into something and look at data to find out whatever it is you can find out, you're going to spend a lot of time and money waste. You know, a lot of time and money will be wasted. You need to figure out what things you want to consider or ask the data before you jump in. And so we're in the next slide. We're actually going to give a couple of examples of ways to break it down, um, even further than than what was mentioned earlier. So th this is just an example of areas you might consider in looking at how you, how you would want to use big data or what value you would want to go after, right? So customer experience, you could do some things in performance management. You could make goals around improving CSAT. Um, a lot of people right now uh, in the last couple of years focus on cost reduction. And really the important thing here is that you as a business person need to know how your business works. You can't just look at a bunch of data and figure out like some great new thing that nobody else thought of. You have to have the business savvy to look and understand, look at the data and understand how to apply that or how that applies to your business. Um, and so these are just uh, you know a few more examples of um, areas that you would want to look into to drive value out of the data that you have or the data that you um, want to start collecting. Uh, on this slide, uh, my, favorite, my favorite on this one is cost reduction and, and then improve efficiency. Uh, and so because of that, I've uh, made a sub slide sort of to talk about how to take this a level deeper. So let's take uh, the improve efficiency one, for example, and Joe, you move one way or the other. <laughs> uh, so, so from uh, one of the sub bullets under improve efficiency was automation opportunities. So uh, again, this sort of gets back to you need to understand what your business is, but there are some common things even about automation opportunities that you could ask to try to define how you want to uh, approach uh, big data um, effort. So things like what sort of recurring tasks occur in your operation? What is the cost of those tasks right now? What options exist to remove those steps? What does that cost? Um, what do you need to measure those steps? And how often do those steps occur? How often do those tasks occur? And and this sort of these sort of sub questions are driving down into some of the detail that will create a business case for you around if it makes sense to even pursue this or not. Because you may answer these questions and say, well, actually, it only happens once a week and it costs ten dollars. And then why would you go stand up a Hadoop database to to ana uh, do analysis on this? Um, so it's important to to try to ask these questions and nail down the facts. So that you know what you're what you're jumping into. Did I get it right, Best Buy guy? <laughs> I have no idea. Like nine Best Buy people are Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So here we have a uh, Wall Street Journal interview with uh, Charles or uh, poor Charles Schwab. Uh, let's see if we can... oh, what's going? I don't know why it's double clicking here. Okay. Okay, so this was a, an interview with uh, Jonathan Craig, the CFO of uh, Charles Schwab, and 
He's really asked about how big data is uh, changing their organization, and specifically, um, I think there's two very good answers on how intern how they're internally driving uh, using big data to drive value, and how they're externally using big data to drive the value. And so I think this is um, on par with a lot of organizations that have recently implemented big data. And uh, his response to the internal process is that previously, before they uh, had big data, they would create a hypothesis and then use the data that they had to validate whether that hypothesis was correct. Yeah. And, we see, and we see that sort of approach taken a lot of different places. And the questions that were on the previous slide about trying to define those facts will help you come up with a quantitative hypothesis that you can say, yes, this was observed, or no, it wasn't observed, and sort of get down to that, was it true or not, fact-based level, to be able to drive business decisions. And with big data, he's, uh, he's mainly saying that they allow the data to drive the insights, and that's, uh, that's led them to <coughs> unexpected and more powerful <coughs> insights. And that's really the value add that they've that they've seen um, specifically with big data. Instead of having to come up with the hypothesis, they're able to let the data drive some of the, the insights, a lot more of the insights. Um, and so he was also asked how the external data, um, how they derive external value for customers with their big data. And mainly he said that um, they're able to get more timely and relevant communications uh, to their clients, they're able to help their clients stay on top of their investing strategy, and they're able to get a more holistic view of each client so that they can serve them better. And this is mainly within their application portfolio using big data as part of their as part of their apps. And I think uh, the last one, specifically the holistic view of each client, is uh, is becoming more and more popular as as this uh, kind of buzz phrase, the uh, market of one. Uh, comes about, uh, c companies have so much data that they're able to market specifically to an individual. They know their, their customers very well and are able to market to them individual as individuals. <coughs> so now we're going to talk about uh, Netflix and how they're uh, gaining new insights to uncover new opportunities. Okay, Netflix uh, has implemented a big data strategy where they are, have been able to look at the viewing habits of their 30 million plus subscribers and have pulled out some powerful insights that have led to some results. And so the insights, the general insights that they've come up with is that roughly 75% of their views come purely from the recommendation engine um, on their homepage. And they're also able to deeply understand the viewing habits of their of their uh, um, subscribers and so the results they've created three very successful exclusive shows from those insights uh, House of Cards, Arrested Development and Orange is the New Black and if you look at the second point uh, a high percentage of Netflix users enjoy dark comedies uh, plot re uh, tra plots revolving around prison or crime and a like, likable female lead, and that's specifically <coughs> Orange is the New Black. Uh, a, an interesting thing about Orange is the New Black is that they hardly marketed the show at all, but it's become the most successful of, of the three exclusive series that they have. And now we're going to talk about uh, case study on Gartner about how Orbitz is monetizing information. So Orbitz implemented a uh, big data solution um, to understand its customers' behaviors and preferences. Um, they mainly used data driven from their, from their website to determine what do customers like, and they use that information to add 50,000 additional daily transactions. So they, they basically um, updated their website to make it easier for users to purchase. Um, and you can see that they've implemented a recommendation module, which produced a 7% interaction rate and 
seen a 2.6% increase in visits from their booking path. And finally, the last one here. I think this one is, is kind of neat. Uh, Brookshire Brothers Grocery uh, Reducing Risk. And so this is a 100-store chain uh, which recently uh, implemented monitoring sensors within their refrigeration units. And they're using that information um, to determine when a refrigeration unit might fail um, and are able to therefore uh, protect food, lower their expenses, and project, uh, project their future needs. Um, so it's really a, a risk management strategy for them. Um, and they do this all by analyzing historical data from these refrigeration units, and they monitor um, existing data or uh, real-time data to determine which units might be failing or which units might be showing signs of failure. <coughs> all right, Dave, yeah, so we no, so we have a we have a resources slide that gives like some of these uh, case studies. I don't know. There, I don't know if you might saw or needs this deck, but um, we can flip back to the front slide, which has a Bitly link. Um, but these are some of the case studies that uh, that Joe went over. Um, just to, some recommendations. Also, if you're if you're interested in getting more on the technical side of things, there's a lot of free resources. So Big Data University and Teradata um, offer some courses. Um, and then the other thing. I added here is sort of inspiration to think about, I guess, is is more traditional KPIs. So again, the, the the view that we have on this is it really just relates back to what are the real business levers that you need to pull to make more money or save more money. And this is these KPIs are both sort of libraries of examples of what different industries use to measure success. And so it's just another another thing that we found useful. So uh, last slide, Q&A. What, what, did, what did you guys come here for? Any questions on the material? Any discussion items? No? Is anybody in here using big data? What are you using it for? Uh, the startup that we do, uh, automated market research for exporters. So basically we take economics and import data and then uh, we, if we, you tell us what your product is, Available yeah, and there's a, there's a few different things too, like we're, like we're trying to quantify, and we're still, it's still in production mode, but we're trying to quantify like what constitutes a trend. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, how many searches for X product constitutes a trend? So like that's something that we're working on too, because there's a lot of data in the sense of search trends and things like that too. So we're really okay. Who else is there? Somebody else that was using the data, right? Okay. Yes, What's been your both of your experiences about coming up with a strategy beforehand? Is, is that something your customers do for you in your case? Um, no, I guess I, I kind of have on the job experience. So what we've had we've struggled with, I guess, is how do you how do you how relevant like data is only good as how, like it's only good if it's really relevant for your customers. So we have to. I mean, it, 
every every business is a little bit different, I guess. But I think the the, the thing that I would uh, expect over the next couple of years is some sort of convergence around the way that these sorts of projects work, so that it, it is more sort of KPI standardized, where in an industry, you know, X, Y, and Z are possible or are common, and here's how you do that. Right. I'm curious how, as to how people actually define a big data problem. Like in, in, in my company, we've got a platform that we restore data on 100 million properties. But the actual size of the database is only, you know, it's less than 10 gigs. Mm -hmm. so the data set size isn't actually that big. Mm -hmm. We're not using to do map mm -hmm. uh, So I'm just curious as to how people in the room would define these big data problems. Is it, is it, are these problems that are only solvable via map reduce? Are they, are they a certain size data set? Does it have to be no. a you know, 100 terabyte plus database? Well, I think, yeah, I think, I mean, I see heads shaking. Uh, yeah, I mean, big, big data, in my view, is just a big pile of data. And whatever your gauge is on, your personal view is on what big is, that's, the answer to your question. The big right. data is whatever won't fit in Excel. <laughs> 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 but that's not new. It's mainly a buzz. Excel's been meeting We've been storing big amounts of data and relational data for 30 years. I think it's just a buzzword, honestly, really. Uh, it, they're referring to the, I, I believe they're referring to the technology, but it's just a buzz, it's just a buzz term. And it, I don't think it's been de really defined. And for the conferences that I went to, they, they have a very difficult time to define it because nobody really knows. It's just a buzzword. It, it means what it means to every individual. Yeah, the, the thing well, that's just, yeah, sorry. I, I think one of the why this requires is the bigness of the data is how many relationships the data have. So when you're structuring it in the database, it's a really multi layer graph. What? And what's the complexity of that? Yeah, well, he's, that actually you, he's actually touching on another sort of commonly thought of way of thinking of is something big data or not, which is the structure or lack of structure of the data. So some people say there really is unstructured data out there, but I would ask you to give me an example of that. Like almost every piece of data has some structure to it. So I think that it's like semi-structured data. But, um, but if you have a bunch of different data types like pictures and log files and music files and that sort of stuff is typically like, you know, Everybody, I think, would agree that if you're doing a lot of work with a bunch of those types of data, it's big data. But, but yeah, I, I like the Excel line. I think I'll use that going forward. Well, my, my day job is <laughs> you write, write a predictive model with the help of a statistician that guess whether or not your parents might be taking their high blood pressure medicine. Right, and it, it, it is big data because you go through thousands, hundreds, of millions of records to try to figure out who the people are, and then you're grabbing healthcare, medical, pharmacy data, yep. demographic information, and from that, you actually create more variables. So even though you might start with data supply and NDC code and date on an NDC, you might end up with 75 columns of data that the statistician uses, because well, how many CCDs, how many office systems in the last six months, all of these things go together to create the predictive model. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of what big data is. It sort of becomes broad as you add value to it. Yep. But, but the interesting thing, too, is talk about developing APIs, and I always throw a big warning out there, I did a contract out in Oakdale, and I, I tell the story because they, they wanted a predictive model around whether or not a political person would donate money when they're caught. And what they did is, is they, they get all this data from a, a, a candidate, and they call them. They just basically call everybody, and that is a cost of that. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing, and, and the, the reason I like to tell the story, biggest tell in all the data is the person's title. If it's Mr. Ampersand Mrs. or Mr. and Mrs., they were on the opposite ends of the prediction. <laughs> and the reason for that was because the candidates bring in lists, and one list was rich, a valuable list, and one was And if you give that list to a lot of IT people, they're going to want to say, oh, those are the same. You don't normalize that. And then all the value that was in the data is gone. So it's really, it's an art to sort of balance that and to know that, oh, you have to understand the business because the data yeah. is good. And that's, that's, that's another interesting point, getting into more of the technical side of things. Um, a lot of what uh, I've heard of people doing as a regular trend now is having what's called data lakes. And basically, you just 
sort of these raw, unfiltered pieces of data into a data lake. And then you have further abstraction levels to do some, like if, if cleansing or normalizing would be something you would want to do, then you, that's a layer abstracted from the actual raw data. Yeah, I guess like my personal definition of, of big data, like you guys talk to the, the variety and, and volume that comes in, but also like for me, it's, it's more around the velocity that comes as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so when, when I think about like going back to the kind of unstructured data, when I think about true big data problems that big businesses come to us and ask us about, it's, it's you know, they, 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 are, they get hung up on the Hadoop and they want to get the Hadoop implementation, but like stuff like that really, that's where you, you're going to get value from Hadoop when you start having more of the unstructured data set. So like unstructured data sets to me might include like network node data coming in, uh, social media, like customer surveys, like those, those for me are how I personally feel about big data problem sets. But when you think about like, have lots of data coming in, but it can still fit in some aspect to like a relational model. Like for me, I guess that that doesn't come across to me as a more of a big data issue, but that's around my personal definition of what I view as a big data problem. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're touching on something that's like th where people try to draw the line between a data warehouse and big data. I think a lot of what pe people really want when they say big data is analytics. They want an an they want answers to questions that they can action. Yeah, <coughs> but that's like saying what's the ideal car. I mean, it's that. I mean, you can look at what's been advertised and think, okay, that's the ideal car and that's the analytic of an ideal car. But it's really a personal thing. Just like I think it really depends on the company and, and how they're structured and where their demographics are yeah. and where they're made. It is and it isn't, right? Because people say it and they mean one thing, and and I think I think that people that are close to the work um, would would be able to all agree on a certain term, but I think everybody else would probably agree on fifty other different terms. Um, so I'll, I'll give my view, and you give your view. Right? Maybe Joe can give his view too. Um, so uh, the common the common icon is like a platypus uh, with a bunch of different stuff around it. And basically, a data scientist is someone that needs to know both of the business side as well as the technology side at a you know, super high level. Um, so they're the guy that's going to understand that um, you know, you're doing X, Y, and Z uh, tasks, and they, this sub-portion of it can be automated, and um, here's the data we need to prove that, and here's how I go stand that up in Hadoop, and here's how I run the queries against it. He's, he's somebody that, uh, he or she is somebody that knows basically the full gamut from start to finish of how to test the data and and what value that's going to bring to the business, essentially. What do you think? Yeah, yeah the, the way we try to talk about in our organization um, is BI is looking backwards. Business I, BI is retrospective. Analytics is prospective. What, what is going, what can we do, how can we affect it? Data scientists basically has three traits, the best of them, experts in all three, but normally they're an expert in one, but they're comfortable in navigating in the other two data lakes. And that's what I call tech, the IT side, math, and do the statistics, and then the business. Mm -hmm. and, and data sits on top of all of that. Mm -hmm. But the best data scientists are an expert in one, and they're comfortable in the other data lakes. But generally, a great data scientist is going to be three people that are good at talking to Yeah. The, the other thing about the, the industry right now is there really aren't what I would consider like a ton of true data scientists uh, using the definition that we're using for the for that reason is that there are people that are really well skilled in one of those areas and so getting a well-rounded person with a lot of experience in each of those areas is, is really difficult which is why they make good money actually a uh, study last year showed that uh, data, data and data scientists uh, shown to be the highest paid uh, professionals and it's actually the largest disparity I see. Uh, 
Michigan. Nope, that's actually the U of M. The U has a the U by the way the the U has a a great uh, uh, computer science program that focuses on analytics as well. Is that talking about tobacco or is college of science and engineering or the one in Charleston? Uh, I am talking about uh, science and engineering. The computer science department. data scientists because they don't get any domain education at all. But, and that's but, a big problem. With but when you combine that with an SMB, so these are people who know how to ask the right questions, how to, how to ask questions of data, and how to do that intelligently. When you combine that with an SMB, a subject matter, matter expert. So, so if this is a biomedical company, you have someone who's an MD working in the field, combine that individual with a data scientist, someone who knows how to ask data challenges for, for a lot of the people who would be in this room is we're all here because we're entrepreneurs or innovators and the things that we're creating are a lot of times on part of the territory. And I think the challenge for us and why I've come to this talk is why I'm interested in big data is, okay, I'm creating this new thing. It'll generate data for me. How do I ask the right question? Because there aren't subject matter experts in a subject that is That's what we uh, sort of tried to, to touch on with the structure of some of the slides is that it, you're, you're absolutely right that in, a, in new fields like what you're talking about, that there's not some book that you can read that's going to tell you do X, Y, Z or ask X, Y, Z question. And so that's why you have to structure it either you, you need to focus on, in my opinion, at least you need to focus on your business areas and how to drive value in, in those different business areas. Uh, or you know, flip it around and look at it from what are the customers going to buy and look at those areas. Um, and then, there, there are companies now that, that uh, you know, claim to specialize in uh, doing data analytics for connected devices. There's, uh, there's Nubo, there's Device Cloud, Vicero, and there's, <coughs> there's, small, there's newer companies or branches of larger companies that are newer companies. Um, and, but the thing is, it, it's not tried and true because I think part of what you're asking there, though, is, is, well, I mean, it depends on your situation, right, and how much time you can dedicate to doing this, but a lot of business people think about data as the most important thing that drives their business. And so involving external people to, to, to help you with that, um, I mean, it's, it's obviously a decision you need to make, but I, I think a lot of people are turning and trying to get internal resources because it's, uh, it's something that can provide such a competitive advantage versus other people in challenges with, uh, with doing that for the large scale deployments, IoT products, for example, is that you're, you're collecting data from your, your products that are ideally going to be spread out and spread out all over the world and this could be large data sets. And as a, as a small company that's starting off lots of products, you don't necessarily want to uh, dedicate internal resources to data warehousing. Yep. You know, building a, a, a data center. I mentioned three programs at the University of Minnesota alone. Yeah, continuing ed is also doing something. St. Thomas has a master's in big data program. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. 
Right. Yeah, certificate. And, certificate. And, and by the way, the, the engineering department is starting to change some of that uh, business-related knowledge there. Yeah. And that's and that's that's big issue. I mean, like I said, you're not data scientists. You don't have business experience to some extent or, or domain knowledge. Um, Winona State had an undergraduate analytics competition last weekend. They had 20 more teams coming in the last coming in two weeks. And they were really smart kids, amazing. Fast and all gave them a giant data set. Kids went all weekend, no sleep, and turned out tremendous. And, and basically, the, the world's changing. And if anybody in here has one of those three pillars of data or two or three, add to it, it's great to do the MOOCs, that's a great place to add on to it, but I tell you, there's kids coming up that are going to kick our butt, and they're smart. Oh, and there's an analytics uh, uh, non-profit in Minnesota, and they have annual Who's events that? and quarter events, and they have... What's what? Do you know the name of the company? For that? Mini Analytics. Fastenal gave them 15 years life of data. Okay. And they did it by segment. So, okay. you know, they Fastenal has all these different customer sure. segments. And they gave them 30 different industry indexes. Okay. And they compared them against the industry indexes. And the winning teams all came to kind of the same conclusion because the math is pretty straightforward. They approached different things. Some of the kids were saying, well, first thing we have to do is better move the seasonality, right. do a predictive model, and add seasonality to December. Well, I meant like what tool did they use? Did they start writing Python on it? Did they Python, R, SAS, okay. Jump, they all brought in different tools. And each person could bring whatever tool they wanted? Okay. Yeah. Seems kind you of want to get a dust bite <laughs> do a hackathon with a giant set of data. Yeah, we're, um, okay, someone's just asking about that in the hallway. Um, but I'd be more interested in like what tool do you use? Like, I think the biggest change, because all the big data problems are SAS just is now announced they're giving their software away to college kids. Yep. Because in here, Prime Therapeutics recently yep. and Medtronic installed MATLAB and STATA respectively because yep. they hired a PhD and that's what they'll use. So what happens is companies are hiring data scientists, people, and then they're buying the tools that the data scientists are comfortable using yep. rather than the other way around. And that's what SAS is going to do. Yeah. Eventually, you'll figure out whether or not uh, you know, my daughter's pregnant, right? <laughs> <laughs> they already know that. stuff obviously they let, they'll let you use it for free for a, I think like the first couple of years of your startup if you're a big data type company and then I don't know what the agreement is afterwards but they've got yeah they've, they'll probably uh, they'll, they'll be pretty nice but, uh, but uh, you like the most expensive in-memory platform on the planet which also happens to be the most high performing right right so because I was just kind of looking into it and it, and it seemed pretty interesting to me because yeah. they it's really powerful stuff yeah. and um, but it's like yeah. this part for people that are potentially going to be millionaires and get paid for it. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, it, it is. It, and um, I, they have they have events 
around the country for you to um, like meet with them or something like that? So just if anybody's ever interested in that, it's, it seems like it's a pretty cool program. We don't answer the questions. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So eventually, though, all of the technology will match in time, right? Like everything will move completely to memory, so you might as well get on that train now. Right? Yeah, I think so. I think. Thank <laughs> you. 